Hi everyone, hey, thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate you stopping by. And hey, would you mind letting me know that you stopped by? If you're watching on YouTube, maybe you could just give it a little thumbs up, or I guess if you didn't like the message, you could give it a thumbs down, but <laughs> just some kind of indication that you stopped by. Or maybe on Facebook, you could you know select one of the emojis or say a little hello or something. This will help me in the future know when and where to post these messages, if at all. And so uh, that would be a great help to me and I would appreciate that. You know, leadership guru John Maxwell has said with regard to relationships, he has said, success in life is when those who are closest to you and know you the best love and respect you the most. I think that is a good indicator. So many of you are entering new stages of life. Maybe you graduated from one school, you're on to another school, or you graduated from school and you're on to a new job or from one job to the next job. Maybe you are going from one job to retirement, uh, whatever that might be. How do the people that you leave behind think of you? How would they describe you? Uh, we're going to talk about a guy who had to say goodbye to some people that he really loved and he cared for, and they gave such a wonderful description of him, and he gave some advice. There's so much we can learn in this message that I just simply called, When It's Time to Say Goodbye. We have all had times, and probably you can think in recent days, we've all had times where we've made plans, we've made you know arrangements and so forth. Um, maybe it's travel plans, and they have gotten disrupted unexpectedly. You know, at situations and circumstances out of our control. I remember Cindy and I sitting in LA airport, uh, I think we were in John Wayne airport all night, and we were thinking, we, at one point we said, you know what, we could have driven home. And then we said to ourselves, we could have driven home and driven back. Um, and that's how long we had to wait. And it was not a, not a fun thing. Some of you have experienced that in, 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 on trips, maybe even this summer. According to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, that sounds like a fun job. Um, but in this year, January to May 22, so right, the first you know, five months, 88,161 U.S. domestic flights were canceled not just changed. Um, that's just U.S. and that's just domestic flights. So on a recent trip this summer, I believe every single flight got canceled and switched. You know, fortunately, we were able to get on a plane eventually, uh, but uh, every, every single time. Why do I mention that? I think as we read the book of Acts and we see Paul traveling around, we forget how many times his plans got changed and how many times he got disrupted and interrupted. And, um, and so I think it's good for us to see that. Now, his very first delay was a good delay. He's on the road. He's going to go persecute Christians because he thinks they're just a bunch of whacked out cult, you know, following uh, crazy people and uh, that they're taking basically the Jewish message and twisting it all around. And so he's on the road. He gets interrupted. His plans get changed because the Lord appears to him, a bright light and so forth. And, and then he becomes, of course, a Christ follower. And he, after that, after he met Jesus and started following him, he goes traveling all around telling people about Christ and that he is the Messiah, Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and how wonderful it is. Um, one of the delays that he meant that we recently saw was in Acts chapter 19 with the whole riot thing. And last week, I didn't get to show you the picture of the, um, um, the theater at Ephesus where they took him with this riot happened and they take him into a theater. Well, this is what, this is what it looks like up here. Um, I want to go visit this someday, but, uh, but it's very, very cool. So he's, you know, he's down there and the people are yelling. It's just very cool. It went in its heyday. It could accommodate 24,000 people. Uh, the construction of it began around 250 BC, and then the Romans came in and, you know, kind of gave it a little amp, amp up there, around 40 to 54. Uh, so, you know, we want to maximize, you know, ticket sales. It's all about ticket sales, right? But, uh, but so he was interrupted by, by this riot, but then that got settled and he's able to move on and keep going. And, and, um, and he moves on. The, the, the situation, you know, was subsided. We, we saw by a, by a city clerk. They, we, you know, it's recorded that way. But, um, but then after that, Paul's free to leave. He's able to go and, and he encouraged people in Ephesus and um, the, all the people that he's around. And he heads to an area of Macedonia until he arrives in Greece. Now, he was going to go to Syria, but he had threats. Scripture says. We read it so quickly, but we realize he was going to go somewhere and now his plans get all disrupted. So we went back to Macedonia with some friends and the friends went ahead and they waited for Paul at Troas. We talked a little bit about that last week when we talked about encouragement. And Troas is in Turkey, uh, if, in case you're wondering. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, if you'd like to grab your, the, the notes or you'll have everything displayed for you there. 
It said, on the first day of the week. Now, we have to remember, Saturday was the, the Sabbath. But they began worshiping on Sunday. Now, this wasn't a command. The Lord didn't say, okay, you're supposed to start worshiping on Sunday. This wasn't a command. It was just a natural response to people meeting to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, and they started meeting on Sunday as a natural response. And Christians have done that ever since. Uh, but it says on the first day of the week, we, so you know, Luke again is including himself, he says, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke, and that word's associated with preaching, to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Now, some of you feel that way on Sundays, right? Does, does Pastor David think this is the last time he's ever going to get to preach? Because it seems like he just gave us a whole bunch. My wife has said at times, that would have been two really good sermons <laughs> that you preached today. <laughs> so, all right, um, this may be one of those, but here, anyway, but, uh, yeah, but you never know, right? So anyway, but, but, but actually Paul knew that he wasn't going to see these people again. That was the probability he would never, ever see them again. And he wanted to, he wanted to pour into them as much as he could and to help them and encourage them and, and, uh, and you know, just express his love for them. And so he goes on and on and on. And it says, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where, where we were meeting. Now, as a physician, Luke might have included this. There's speculation. Why would he talk about this? No other uh, description is given like that in any meetings like that. But why was it all, the, all these lights? I think from the standpoint of a, of a doctor, he's thinking, okay, lots of lights, you know, a lot of uh, oxygen's being sucked out of the air, uh, probably, you know, not that great of in, um, uh, ventilation. It's, it's a high building, three-story st house. And so uh, he may have just been sharing that to kind of set up what's going to happen. Um, there were probably, you know, floors and then lamps on each floor. And so it probably got kind of hot and stuffy in there. But, um, and also if you think about oil lamps, you know, they're like candlelight. Now, um, those of you who, you know, if you go out for a romantic dinner, you know, uh, you have a nice candlelight and it's, and it's nice unless you're really tired, right? <laughs> have you ever walked into a place? Maybe as we're getting, sitting nights, we're getting on and think, well, they need to put a little more light in this place. I want to see what I'm eating or whatever, you know, you're doing this with the menu, right? Whatever it is. Well, they, they've got lots of, <laughs> of oil lamps going off and, um, and it says seated in a window, maybe to get fresh air. I don't know. Um, was a young man named Eutychus. And it, it, some it may be, think that he might've been a teenager. But this young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. I love the way Luke says that. Now, the, the, the Greek, if you were to read this in Greek, you, it would be an indic there's an indication there that he was fighting off, nodding off. You know, you, you've done this, right? Right? Um, nobody yet today. But that's good. Um, but this poor guy, you know, he's, feel, he's on the nods here. You know, he's fighting this off, drifting and then snapping himself back up. You have any of you ever do that drifting, you know? Uh, over. Well, this picture that. That's what's happening with this guy. Now, I don't picture Paul being soft-spoken, but you know, you, anybody can talk long enough and you can make anybody drift off, but you know, so that could be really tough. And, and just in general, isn't sleep a weird thing? You know, you can be sitting at your desk, you can be driving your car and you are fighting sleep. You know, I, have that, I hate driving and feeling sleepy. Um, but then that night, maybe that very night, you're laying in bed going, how come I can't fall asleep? What's, I, I, I was fighting sleep in my car. You know, why can't I transfer this? Sleep is just a general kind of a, a weird thing. When I was in college, there were classes that were designed just for pastors, just for ministers and so forth, and missionaries, people who were what we call Bible majors. Or in the South, it was preacher boys. So there were classes designed just for that. And there was, <laughs> there was one particular class where um, the, the teacher, and this wasn't a comment, but I always would have us pray. And um, so it, during the class, sometimes he would kind of give a little introduction, and then he would have one of us pray, or, you know, maybe it was just like right at the very beginning. Well, well one day, there was one of the guys that was in there, and he had worked all night. And he walked in and this, the uh, professor starts talking and man, he nods off to sleep and his buddy next to him just, you know, at, really got him really, I mean, let him go into a really, really deep sleep. And then he pokes him and says, Hey, the teacher asked you to stand up and pray. Yeah. So he jumps up and he starts praying, dear heavenly father, you know, and the professor was awesome. He kind of took it. He says, he goes, you know, he let, he let him finish his prayer. And he said, he, he said to Mr. So-and-so, you know, he says, uh, I appreciate your passion for prayer. 
but we've already prayed and I, you were in the, my middle of my lesson. And oh, of course, you know, we, ha we had a great time with that. So it was all fun. But here he is. He's fallen into a deep sleep. Paul's talking on and on. Um, and, uh, and, and it says, when he was sound asleep. Now, I, I do remember as a kid, there was a guy in our church who used to fall asleep and snore. And as kids, we thought it was hilarious. Not a big ego, ego boost to the pastor, of course. But <laughs> we, we, we thought it was hilarious. But anyway. But it says, when he was sound asleep, this is when it goes all bad. He fell to the ground from the third story. And, and we don't know if we felt he fell outside or fell, you know, it was an inner kind of thing where, you know, off like a, a balcony or something. But oh my goodness. So he falls from the third story and then was picked up dead. I mean, we're talking Humpty Dumpty story here, right? I mean, yeah. I thought about calling this message a killer sermon, but then I thought, <laughs> yeah, you know, but anyway. Now, those who don't believe in miracles say, oh, well, Eutychus wasn't really dead. Um, he didn't really die. But here's Dr. Luke, right, a physician. And he's there and he's saying, no, 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 this guy was dead, dead, dead. Well, verse 10 says, Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Then he says, don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Now, Paul wasn't saying that Eutychus didn't really die. In fact, literally, the Greek says, the life of him is in him. It wasn't but it, it's back. And um, now I don't want to overly encourage, you know, everybody, but here, see, even falling asleep in church can bring glory to God, right? Especially if you die. See, there we go. Um, but Paul falls on him. He's praying. He's got, you know, just praying with great power. Um, and then he announces that he's alive. What happened? God gave him back his life. He raised this dead young man back to life. In verse 11 says, then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. Now I've got to hand it to Paul. This just shows the tenacity of Paul. If one of you fall over dead, um, I'm just going to end the service. Okay. I probably won't wait around. I mean, that usually is a cue. If somebody's dying to just go ahead and say, okay, God bless. Let's end this. But, uh, but of course he raises Eutychus from the dead. Well, that's got to get the adrenaline going. So I'm sure Paul's like, good. He's revamped. He's ready to go. God raises him from the dead. So he, he keeps going for, hey, let's go a couple more hours anyway. Right? Well, it says after talking until daylight. <laughs> so, so he, he's all night uh, time. He says he, it, Paul left. Now I kind of picture Luke probably saying, he finally stopped talking and left, but he didn't say it that way. Um, so Paul, though, literally preaches all night long. You guys thought I was bad. Um, of course, after seeing someone raised from the dead, I think there'd be a renewed enthusiasm for whatever that message is. But in verse 12, it says, the people took the young man, Eutychus, home alive and were greatly comforted. Absolutely. It's funny, this, the, the, the name Eutychus actually means happy or fortunate. And um, I think, yes, he really, really was both of those, wasn't he? Um, so what's the purpose of him mentioning this funny, tragic, then miraculous story? I have heard preachers talk about, oh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, fall asleep. We shouldn't fall asleep spiritually. They try to take this and I think make it a little bit more than it's meant to be. Because, you know, it's interesting. Paul never reprimands the young guy. He never says, you know, okay, now you're alive, but hey, stay awake next time. Or that's what you get for falling asleep in church or what you never see him reprimanding, uh, you know, him at all. But, um, um, uh, I had a professor and I love this professor because he used to say, it was very interesting too, but he said, if any of you fall asleep in class, either you need it or I deserve it. And that's always been my philosophy. So if you fall asleep while I'm preaching, hey, either you really need it or I deserve it. So um, he also was a guy who let us stand in class. And we did. And take notes. We'd lean on the back wall. And, you know, just so, we, you know, we're all, we're all working and going to school and all of that. But, but here he is. They're comforted. They're excited. And I believe Luke includes this story in order to show us really the life-giving power of God. He doesn't record any of what Paul said all night long. And I think this story was kind of a message of really the truth of, you know, the foundations of following Jesus. So I want to just share those with you really quick because it says that they came to break bread, which is communion we call today, um, you know, the Lord's table. And what's the significance of communion? It's remembering that Jesus died, was buried and rose again for us. And so the first thing that we see as a foundational truth of Christianity is we gather together to celebrate the good news. The word gospel means good news and refers specifically to the fact that Jesus 
God's son is the Messiah, the savior of the world who came. And, and if all who will receive him receive eternal life, his death paid the penalty for our sin. And, and that by rising from the dead, he was victorious over sin and death and hell. And, um, and his resurrection allows us to be a child of God. And I think that that was such an important realization as we see them take, saying, we got together to break bread. Some, because some might say, well, break bread, weren't they just eating? When you see that phrase, especially in the New Testament, he, he's referring to them getting together and celebrating communion together. Um, the lamps, that, that's interesting detail, but I just think that it gives us a reminder that Jesus is the light and the source of truth. I think that's an important thing. That's the second thing there. Um, Jesus is the light. He doesn't say that. Um, Luke doesn't say, see, this shows that Jesus is the light, but I just, I think it gives us a good illustration and a picture. I mean, why does, the, why does he make such a point of mentioning the light? Well, I mentioned about the physical part that Luke, the doctor might have said, well, wow, you know, there a lot of, it was very hot and stuffy and whatever. But perhaps another reason was to dispel a very well uh, spread rumor about Christians. They would spread rumors that Christians would go into dark rooms and do really horrible, abominable things like eating flesh and, and drinking blood. Now you can kind of see where they got it, right? <laughs> you know, because Jesus in that pattern said, this is my body, this is my blood, you know, and, um, and, and nobody's, nobody went into dark rooms and was, you know, eating flesh and drinking blood. But the fact that they were celebrating communion, it could be that Luke wanted to point this out. God had Luke point this out to say, hey, just those of you who are spreading that rumor, be advised, there's lots of light here. Everybody can see what's going on. Paul's preaching a long time. And the bread and the wine, or in our case, grape juice, is a symbol of Christ's body and his blood. And, um, and it commemorates how he suffered for us. No one then or now is literally eating the flesh and blood. There are some that teach that you are doing that, that it uh, you know, turns spiritually, it turns into the physical body and blood of Christ, but um, that's not the case. That was never Jesus's intention. Um, the third thing is, is that we are all, looking at Eutychus, we're all spiritually dead, right? We're all born spiritually dead, but Christ came to bring life. We are all, as human beings, created in God's image, but we're not God. God gave us that ability. He created us because he has the ability to choose. He gave us the ability to choose. And the first humans, Adam and Eve, who you know, chose to go their own way. And as offspring of Adam and Eve, we choose the same thing. We were born with that nature. And so we are all born dead, separated from God. Ephesians 2, 1 says this. It says, as for you, all of us, every single one, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And that doesn't have to be the end of the story, though. We know that. The Apostle Paul prayed this great prayer in Philippians 3.10. I don't have it in your notes, but he talks about how he wanted to be, be associated with the power of Christ. He wants the power of, the, of Christ's resurrection in him to live in him and through him. And, and God answers that prayer to anyone who will call on him. The other thing is, is that the gospel, number four, the gospel is about resurrection. Um, many people think, and you probably have experienced this, many people think that becoming a Christian is just, you know, no more fun. You, your life gets sucked away from you. You just don't get to have any good times at all. And let me tell you, it's the exact opposite. You, you go from a, being a place of being dead, dead spiritually, to having new life, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's more life than you've ever had. And... Um, and if Jesus had just died, and that was it, he would have been a martyr. But he rose from the dead, proving that he is God's son. The, the message of the gospel is that God saves us by raising us from the dead to new life. Um, that, that contact with God that results in new life. You know, there's a lot of evidence that, a lot of evidence that Christ rose from the dead. Um, the empty tomb, the grave clothes, there's archaeological and historical things, the changes in the life of the disciples that we can trace back and on and on. But just mentioning, um, and I could go on about the, all the historical facts and archaeological uh, finds and so forth that would point to the resurrection of Christ. But even the fact that these people started worshiping on Sunday is an indication that, of, of, of something very, very life-changingly important happened. Uh, here we are. They changed the day of their worship to Sunday. Now, why would that be particularly amazing? Because these people are Jews. These people are Jewish. 
who, and that's who mostly made up the first you know, Christian congregations were all Jewish people. And, and they're trained by these centuries of tradition and you know, the hey, worship on the seventh day. It goes way back to Genesis, you know, God rested. And then following in the Ten Commandments, you know, hey, Sabbath day, keep it holy. And all of a sudden they switch that. Why? That's the significance. Christ rose from the dead. There's only one expl explanation, and that's that. The fifth thing is, is that our new life that we have in Christ, Eutychus rose. What, what did they do? Well, our new life revolves around worship and fellowship. It's that, it's that vertical relationship we have with God, though God's with us, right? And our horizontal relationship with others. Um, he continues this on. As soon as this young man was alive again, what do they do? They go back to celebrating the message of Christ. They go right back to it. That's, that's why we're here today, to celebrate the message of Jesus, that he died, was buried, and rose again. That's why we're here today. And, um, well, the people take Eutychus home, and Scripture records that Paul starts walking. He heads off walking. Now, this is a picture. I'm going to read some Scripture, but... Um, the scripture background, uh, the next one, you can go into change it, Cindy, um, is actually part of the road to Assos, which he, um, he's traveling. So it says in verse 13, um, we, Luke and the other companions, went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos. Today, it's, um, it's an Aegean coast retreat. If you Google it, it's really, really beautiful. You think there's a vacation spot, really beautiful, but it has ancient ruins around it that you, that you can go and see, so it's beautiful. But it says that they sailed... Where, and then where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. I don't know why. Just wanted to walk. Maybe he wanted to pray and walk. Just uh, you know, wanted to think. We don't see him stopping and talking to anybody. But maybe he just needed that quiet time. Um, and he decided to walk from Troas to Assos. It's about 30 miles. Um, and so, uh, in fact, uh, I, I've got a Google map of it. Okay. So they started up at the top and came around to meet him. Paul just walked. That's, that's 30 miles. I know that feeling. Sometimes I like to head down the, the trail near our house and just kind of talk quiet. You know, it's, um, it's talk to the Lord. Just, and and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there. I'm not exactly sure. But it says that, um, that he made that arrangement. Verse 14 says, When he met us at Assos, he took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that, um, after that, we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived in Miletus. That's another ancient Greek city. Um, this is, these are Greek islands here. And this would have been the area in which he was walking, um, the background ground there. And so Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in that province of Asia. Now, we have to stop just for a second and say he loved the Ephesians. Why would you keep yourself from, why would you keep yourself from stopping at a place of, with people you love? Because you're going to stay there too long. I understand this. I understand this whole thing. Um, I've got to avoid people. <laughs> if I call them, if I go over there, I, you know, it could say, hey, I just need to talk to you for five minutes, hour and a half later. I, so I know that feeling. But that's what Paul, Paul knew. He goes, if we get together, who knows? Last time I was there, I'm preaching all night, you know? So, but um, it says, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So even though he couldn't stop at Ephesus, he still wanted to pour his life, and his heart into the leaders of that church at Ephesus. So it says in 17, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. They're going to have a little conference, a little retreat. Um, these were men that Paul had discipled. He had led them for three years we read in scripture, and then appointed to care for God's flock. And so um, he just wanted to pour into the life of these leaders as well, you know, as to share doctrine, make sure that they understood uh, the message of Christ. He had great expectations for the future of the ministry. Now, Paul is on his farewell tour and has one last opportunity to communicate with these guys face to face. And it says in verse 18, when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. I think that's an amazing statement. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. Um, it's what I really want to launch for the rest of the just of our time together because of that. So Paul is saying goodbye. What if you were, picture yourself retiring and you had a meeting with everybody you had worked with over the years. And you said something like, well, you know how I've lived. You've seen me every day for all these years. 
Um, you've seen how I've worked. You've seen that. What would they be thinking? You're graduating college. You're telling your college mates, you know, on the graduation. Hey, you guys, well, you know how I did college. Somebody in the back goes, yeah, party, right? <laughs> um, how did you do college, right? You're saying goodbye. How about your family? Um, family, they're not so easy to fool, are they? I mean, they see us at our most vulnerable. Uh, maybe your kids are growing up and they're leaving the house and they, you know, and they, and you say to them, all right, you guys are leaving the house and, well, you know what kind of father I was. You know what kind of a mother I was. You know what kind, you know how I treated your mother. You know, I treated your father. You know, I, treat, you know, you know, you watched me. You know how I lived in front of you. What a powerful statement for him to make. Uh, reminded me, remember that old, I, I think, I don't know if they're still around. Is Tombstone Pizza still a thing? But remember the uh, commercial that is, they used to say, you know, what would you like on your tombstone? Now, I'm not going to get morbid here at all, but, uh, you know, obviously they're playing off the, off the name. Um, but we're not going to get morbid here, but we are going to think, how would people remember us? If it's, when it comes time to say goodbye, how would people remember us? Paul says, you know how I lived. What would that look like for us? If you were to suddenly leave your job right now, suddenly leave school, suddenly you're suddenly graduating, you're suddenly, you know, moving out of your neighborhood and you get those people together that you've spent time with, you know, the last, let's just say three years, because that's how it was for them. Well, you know how I lived. He said, you know how I lived from the first day I came into the province of Asia. He says, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. And so I thought what we could do just to close this is to look at some encouragement from Paul's farewell speech. Because we saw the message of Jesus through that you know, illustration of Eutychus. But we don't know what the opposing Jews in Ephesus were doing to Paul and all that. He makes reference to that. But one thing that he does say to us is this, is to serve God with sincerity and strength. That would be part of his farewell message. Because he says, you see, you've watched. You know, I don't, um, I don't know, again, what those opposing Jews that he makes reference to in Ephesus were saying. But even rejecting the message of Jesus would have broken his heart. He served through good times. He threw, served through a lot of really hard times as well. But uh, Paul may have had a strong personality I think he really did when you read his writing, but I know he was also willing to be vulnerable. He even says, he's, you know, you saw my tears. You saw my broken heart. You saw that. Um, because he didn't rely on his own strength, his own skill, Paul was free to share his weaknesses, what he struggled with. Um, he writes about even some of the physical struggles he had and how it was, you know, he was getting prideful and God humbled him. And he was just able to share honestly. In verse 20, it says, you know, that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Here's a hard one. It's going to be a quick statement, but it's a hard one to live out. And that's this. I think Paul would tell all of us when you have to, you know, while before you say goodbye, don't hold back the truth. Don't hold back the truth. Um, I'm often asked, or I used to be more than I am now, but I was often asked, how do you decide what to preach? I pray a lot, of course, about what to preach. But then, I mean, oftentimes my prayer is something like, Lord, what would be helpful for people? What do people need to hear? Whether it's hard for me to say or hard for them to hear, what do people need to hear? And Paul says, hey, I was just preaching to you what was helpful, what you needed to hear. God made it clear. And um, that um, some years ago, this was a very hard decision for me. And I'll explain why. But several years ago, it was like God said to me, David, I don't want you preaching your messages strictly for church people anymore. Strictly for Christians. Now, if you were where I am, people who are like me and believe like me, that's very easy to put together messages for people like that. Very easy. But to constantly have in my mind that there may be people that come and are either hostile or checking it out or seeking or whatever, or online, they're not sure. They're just kind of, um, you know, not going to go to church, but I'll just check out the message. I, God made it really clear that I couldn't have my messages strictly for believers. Now, most people that watch my messages are, or, or you sit here, are Christians, okay, percentage-wise. But 
It was hard because I knew that that was what God wanted. And I think Paul was kind of saying that. Jews, Gentiles, whoever it was, I'm going to give, you the, I'm going to give it to you straight. And, um, and I know you get into situations at work or at school or in your neighborhood, and you've got people in your life that you just don't click with, right? You just, you just don't, um, I mean, you're just not close to them. They need to hear the message of the gospel too. There may be people at work you don't like, but you interact with them on, on an ongoing basis. And you need to be willing to, to share that. Paul would say, don't hold back. God wants us to be willing to tell anyone that we come across the message of the truth that they need to hear and in a way that they can hear it. The third thing I think Paul was also saying here is that realize that our future here on earth is uncertain. I think we could take the whole journey that Paul went on through the, the, you know, this latter part of the book of Acts and conclude that he didn't know exactly what was ahead of him, but he, he had legitimate reasons to feel like, hey, things aren't going to go too well. Uh, like, for example, the Holy Spirit telling him, as we'll see in a moment. But, um, but he didn't let that control him. I think the thing that trips me up the most in life sometimes is unknowns. You have that in your life where you're not sure what's going to happen in the meeting tomorrow. You're not sure what's going to happen a month from now. You're not sure what the doctor's going to say when you walk in after all the tests. I mean, it's, there's just this unknown. And Paul wasn't sure what was ahead of him, but he didn't allow it to steal his joy. Because see, he had a confidence. Now, if you, if you don't have a confidence in God, that God's in control of your life, that will be very, very unnerving. But when we're letting him do that, when we're letting him control it, then it makes all the difference. Paul could, have, could, could give it all over to God and say, whatever happens, happens. And um, he didn't know what was about to happen. But it says in verse 22, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. Not knowing what will happen to me there, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Some of you uh, probably, you know, God, God knows what you can handle, what you can't. So uh, sometimes God will have situations in our life where he'll go, David, brace yourself. <laughs> right? Sometimes he doesn't tell me because if, if, if he tells me, I will just freak out, I, you know, and so God knows. But with Paul, he just said, Paul, hang on. The Holy Spirit told him, said, you're going to have some prison. You're going to have some hardships. It's going to be tough. And so he prepared himself. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Well, was Paul suicidal? No. Did he like pain? Of course not. He just knew that he was created for something bigger than comfort. And Paul's saying, look, I get it, you know, and I, I'm sure he didn't enjoy being in pain. He didn't enjoy being in prison. He didn't enjoy all of that. But he said, there's something, there's something bigger. Um, just like, I mean, that, that mother will do anything for that baby. Paul says, hey, pain or no pain, I have a goal. I've got a task God gave me to do. I'm just going to do it. And it's, you know, it's, that's the way it is. And he goes, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And so that's what we need to do. Number four, he would say to all of us in his farewell message, he was saying to those people at Ephesus, you kind of have to pretend you're one of those Ephesian elders. He's saying, be faithful to what God tells you to do. Maybe he would even say, you know, pointing out to people, be faithful to what God tells you to do. What tells you to do, tells you to do. See, here's the thing. God's not asking any of us to be the apostle Paul. He already had one of those. God needs you to be you. But interestingly, the task that generally that he describes is the same. It's the same for all of us. He says, you know, I'm to testifying up to the good news of the great of God's grace. Tell people the good news and let them see God's grace working in you and through you. That's, I mean, the task is the same. How it'll play out and where you'll do it, that'll be different. I, I think what's hard, and as maybe it's a pastor thing, I don't know, but I, I think there's other Christians that may feel this way, but some people feel like you're responsible to save the world. You know, fix all of your friends' problems, fix all of their lives and, and, and everything, and, ha and make sure your kids turn out perfect, and, you know, save the poor and the orphan. You know, you, you feel like, wow, because God's given us this big task to do. Um, so you carry this weight of all of these things that you feel like, and no matter what you do, um, it's never enough. That tends to be my, my leaning, you know, and my struggle. But um, you know, they're always worried. Now, on the other side, there's people who you know, never really stop to think about that they've been given a God-given responsibility 
and a task to let the light of Christ shine through them. And I mean, either of those extremes can be debilitating. But success, I'm going to throw that word around, but I think success in our walk with God is identifying what God's called you to do and being completely faithful in that. Um, Yes, that includes being a faithful son and being a faithful father and faithful daughter and faithful mother and husband and wife and employee, employer, and all of those different things that, you know, those hats that we wear. Faithful friend, the people that you call your friends, do they know? In, in verse 25, it says, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom of God will ever see me again. Paul said he has, you know, he was focused on finishing the rate, completing the task he had for him, even though it was a sad time, that he was not going to see them ever again. But what he knew is mentioning that finish line, it's like there's a finish line, and then I'll see you. I'll see you on the other side of the finish line. We're all running for the finish line, so I'll, I'll see you over there. Um, he'd see him one day. Therefore, I declare to you, verse 26, therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. In other words, he could lead these Christians with good care, um, knowing that he had not hesitated to share God's truth with them. There is something very freeing about knowing you did what God asked you to do, whether the friend, family member, whatever, accepts the message or not. Um, I've never shared Jesus with anyone that later I thought, man, I shouldn't have done that. Never, never had that happen. I've looked back and thought, ah, oh, I could have worded that differently. I could have shared more. I could have, you know, maybe I shared too much. What, I, but, the, but I've never, ever, ever had a time when I have shared Christ with somebody and I thought, well, that, I, sh I should have waited. <laughs> never, never done it. And, and here's the thing. Paul was saying, and the reason why he got the elders together was number five, we can't do it all ourselves. Now, again, this is very convicting to me to, because I've lived so much of my life thinking I had to do it all. Um, we see Paul doing a wonderful thing of passing the baton. He's giving it to the leaders, but anyone in, the lead, in leadership knows, and I'm talking about leadership in general. If you're in leadership, whether it's spiritual leadership or leadership at work, the first person you have to lead is yourself, right? Well, look what it says in, in verse uh, 28. It says, keep watch over yourselves, leaders, elders of Ephesus. Keep watch over yourself. Pay attention to your own life. Why? Because nobody just accidentally becomes a Christ follower. Nobody's relationship with God just accidentally starts growing. It's a relationship. It's not a religion. You, you, you won't go, grow as a child of God without paying attention to it. It's not that we, we don't earn it. We don't earn salvation. We don't, you know, it's, it's a gift from God. But as we, you know, have that time with him, that's what helps us to grow. He says to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. He says then pay attention to yourself. Get yourself right. Make sure you're right. And then pay attention to those around you. The other people of God, love them, look out for them, care for them, help them, nurture them. Because the Holy Spirit has made you leaders. The Holy Spirit has made you a believer. Okay? The Holy Spirit is, is who drew you to accept Christ. So don't, we can't miss that. Which he, he bought with his own blood. Jesus did. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Again, don't ever forget that you're most likely to experience the most trials when you are doing the right thing. When I am completely self-centered and selfish, I don't, get, I don't really experience spiritual trials. Why? Because I'm no threat to anybody except to myself. I'm no threat to, I'm no threat to Satan if I'm completely self-consumed. In fact, I'm right where he wants me. But as soon as you start doing the tasks God has for you and you start following the Lord, guess what? That's when you're going to start feeling the tension. And that's what he's saying. Don't be surprised. They're coming after you. Even, verse 30, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, be on your guard. Then he goes back. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you, each of you, night and day, with tears. I mean, the passion that he had. He cared about these people. This wasn't just a lecture. This was his heart. 
And he says, now I commit to you, God, and to the word of his grace. So he goes, hey, here's a couple of prayer, or here's a couple of weapons, prayer and God's word. Those are your weapons. And he says, which can build you up and give you an inheritance. Who gets an inheritance? Well, I mean, strictly speaking, I guess kids, you know, that's our first thought anyway. Um, and because of what Jesus did, the believer is given the right to be a child of God, to be reconciled with our heavenly father, to live for all of eternity. We get that inheritance from God. And it says, among all those who are sanctified, anyone who accepts Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is assured that they are a child of God. But then look what Paul says. He goes on, he says, as he's closing is, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Now wait, why, why would Paul say that? Um, I mean, we all know nobody goes into ministry to, for the money, right? And maybe I'm more aware of these kinds of things than you are. Um, I, I saw an article about uh, the, the richest ministers in, in the United States. There's, um, there's actually some that are billionaires in other parts of the world. But um, so number one, so, you know, a guy in Texas, I won't name his name, but he's worth $760 million. Now, I mean, I don't mind people being a little ambitious, but does that seem like they might be coveting somebody else's gold and silver? Well, I guess not because they've got it all, right? Uh, all. But wow, I think somebody's losing sight here, right? And I feel very blessed. I've been very blessed in life. I've been very blessed even financially, you know, but oh my goodness, it's like, but, but he wanted to make it very clear. He goes, I didn't get into this to, you know, for your gifts or your money. Paul didn't just say that he was, you know, wasn't in it for the money. He actually lived it. He goes, you yourselves know, in verse 34, you yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. Because we read how Paul makes tent, made tents and so forth to help fund his journeys. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so in our lives, in our sharing, in our sharing with each other as a church, as it is with sharing with people that we come across, I thought, how do I take this? Because I don't want to confuse it with money. We always, you know, a lot of people use that with money. But make it our goal to give more than we receive. Now, I have to say, it's a really great goal with people. You can't do this with God, though. God's already given us more than we will ever, ever, ever be able to repay. So there, there's that. But I mean, God's just given us so much, you know, because and at this point, all I can do is just say thank you and worship him and give him my life, you know, and not there, you know, God doesn't want any payment for anything he paid for at all. But as we serve people to have the attitude that we give more than we receive, um, I think that's so important. It's true. And that has truly been my goal, you know, in ministry. So next month, 33 years next month. And I'm thinking, and I really, it, it's always been my hope and dream. And there's been times when people have really poured into my life and really been a help and really been an encouragement. But I always wanted to be giving more than I received. Um, in, in verse 36, it says, when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was a statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. I think we can, I think we can learn so much from this journey that he took and, and the goodbyes that he said. Um, some of you, again, we've, you've left the school, you graduated. Uh, others of you left a job. And move to another. Others of you have, you know, left a job and not gotten another job. <laughs> you, you know, retired. Some of you, are, you are parents like Cindy and I, where you're empty nesters. Um, and I have to say, I'm so glad that my kids live close, because <laughs> um, that would uh, that would be so hard. But um, but in all those cases, what would be the response if somebody, if you ask this group, whether it's your family or somebody you group you with, with, well, you know how I lived. You know how I lived. The people that you have spent time with and watched you. See, one day we will, and I've got, you know, just put it out here. One day we all will say goodbye for the last time. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. How will we be remembered? Even, even more importantly, as sure as the apostle Paul was, that as soon as he left this life, that he'd be with the Lord. Are we that sure? God wants us to be that absolutely positively sure. 
many of you, I mean, you've accepted Christ. Um, but if you haven't, you can accept him today. You can ask for his forgiveness. You can ask him to save you and make you his child. Maybe you say, well, David, I, I've gone to church and I, you know, I've been believing things for a long time, but I, I'm not certain. God wants you to be certain. Do you know the Bible says that it was written? First John says, these things are written that you might know you have eternal life. God wants us to know without a shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life. So if you've never done that, as I do you know, each week, most weeks, um, I want to lead you in a prayer. And there's no magical words that result in salvation. This is a decision of your heart. It's a step of faith. You're, you're repenting and saying, I'm no longer going my own way. I'm going God's way. It's only in faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that we, that we are saved. So if you understand that, that you're a sinner and you need him, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And, and you can pray that to God today. Um, or you can use your own words and express that. But um, if this helps, just follow along. Just say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve the consequences of my sin. However, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ as my savior. I believe that his death and resurrection provided for my forgiveness. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much again for joining me today. I really do appreciate this opportunity. And as always, if there's any way I can be of help or encouragement to you, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can Facebook message me. You can email me. Um, if you'd like me to talk on the phone, maybe there's something you'd like to talk about, um, I would be glad to send you my phone number. Um, maybe you just have questions or something you would like me to pray for. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for you. I'm. This is why I post these, just to be a help and an encouragement to you. So if there's anything I can do, please feel free to contact me. In the meantime, thanks again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to connecting with you again next week. Take care and God bless.